Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please show us and 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 fill our tanks this morning uh, with a sense of your love and fatherly care to us in Jesus. We pray. Amen. For years, I've been telling people that I speak to about Christianity to read Mark's Gospel, and I think I need to change that to 1 John and try that for a while. Uh, it's just been a really interesting journey. I've, we've been on Friends Together in, the, in this little letter already of 1 John. It's hiding in the back of the New Testament. I think it's hard to find, actually. You know, Paul's letters, you know your way through. You can find Revelation, but 1 John is tucked here at the back. That This letter presents itself to us as a handbook to the Christian life, to what the gospel is and to what being a Christian is. And John is actually at pains to give a little handbook and he says things like, this is how you can tell who's a Christian and who's not. This is how you can tell who's got eternal life and who hasn't. And they're important questions. They're, they're the questions. And so it's really good that we're here in 1 John today. I would commend to you uh, recommending 1 John to your friends. Um, it helps if you, if, you, if you want people to read the Bible, um, buy them a Bible, buy them a nice one, even if it costs you 30, 40 bucks. It's a good way to kind of, good gift to give. Many people have strong opinions, you see, about Jesus, but they haven't read the Bible. And so we, we kind of want to at least say to them, at least know what you're rejecting, so have a look at it. So 1 John, here we are, it's good for seekers, it's good for new Christians because it's an introductory handbook, but it's also good for mature believers like the back 1015 congregation. And really what I want to um, suggest to you is why don't you try what some people call Christian meditation on 1 John? That is, um, we've all read the Bible quickly. And we've all read the Bible, you know, in a crisis, uh, when we're desperate for something. But have you ever tried just getting a quiet hour? And I'm not saying do this every day, but just a quiet moment with a good chair and a, your cup of tea and to read a book uh, slowly, considerately, prayerfully, meditating on the truths in it, kind of marinating yourself in it. Um, 1 John is a great book for that because it's kind of spaghetti-like. It it weaves in and out of themes. It just rewards sitting down and reading it again and again, slowly. And and what I recommend with Christian meditation on on a scripture like this is to have a pen and a journal and to write, what am I learning about God and what he's done for me? And and what what can I thank him for? What can I worship him for? Um, Why don't you try it, friends? Because... For me and for you, I I suppose, life gets weary and life has a way of wearing you down. And so as well as all your normal Christian commitments, take take a one-off chance to fill the tank spiritually. Take take a one-off sort of session to really let 1 John fill your tank uh, and so you're not just missing and glossing over things. There's a bomb in today's reading. There's like a truth bomb, a game-changing um, promise or statement. And if you're just doing daily Bible reading, you may just pass over it. Look with me at chapter 3, verse 1. And really, we're going to meditate on this. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. Behold, the kind of love with which God loves you is fatherly love. Maybe we take for granted that we're children of God in the gospel. That oh, yeah, all Christians are children of God. Oh, yeah, you know, sure, sons and daughters. But for John, it seems to be a truth that blows him away, even though he's writing at the end of his life in his 80s. You can feel his heart beating, his heart singing, you know, that we could be called children of God. That is what we are. It's a special thing to have the fatherly love of God in the gospel, and it's ours. Um, recently, I, 
my family and I, I'm a graduate of Melbourne Uni and I, was a, I used to go to the Melbourne University Christian Union, the, the campus Christian group, and, and they advertised that you can visit their media conference in the evening. And so I took my family because I, wa- I want my kids to go to Christian Union if they go to university. And we, we actually sat and we heard a talk on, one, on this verse, on 1 John 3. And, and you go to the, this is a room full of like hundreds of young adults um, actually, it was at Belgrave Heights where I met my wife at a young adult Christian university conference. So that was kind of nice. And you, you walk in and they give you a, they give you a talk outline and it has quotes and, and points of the, of the message. And one of the points on the sheet they handed out was um, something like, God is our father, our true father, in a way that our broken and wicked fathers are not. Fair enough, that's a good point. But I'm sitting in the sermon, and I look to the left of me, and my daughter, Charlie Kate, has underlined, like, broken and wicked. <laughs> and I'm just like, what have I done? Oh. And I kind of look at her, and she looks at me, and she just has the biggest grin, you know, and she's ribbing me, you know. So she just thought this was a funny thing that you'd have to say that. And I just sort of thought, well, Charlie, Kate, one day I'm going to let you down. And it's not going to be a joke. You know, one day I'm going to really let you down. And you're going to need your father in heaven. And your father on earth is going to be but a shadow. Uh, and it's true, isn't it? So whether your father has been uh, good and protective and a blessing and caring or whether your father has been difficult and maybe even hurtful or harmful that that all all just generates that sense we long for a father and 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 the father has not hid himself and he's not just meeked out a little bit of love he's lavished love on us through his true son jesus so this this is not a metaphor this is not an illustration this is a spiritual truth it's a spiritual reality it's your true identity that you belong to god the father in fact i mean i i think you know god as trinity is is the truest thing we can know about god now and in eternity there's no there's no deeper hidden levels of god god father son one god spirit uh you know that's god and so for god the father to lavish his love on us that is our truest spiritual identity that's who we are and this sense of lavish i think implies adoption you know this sense that we were outside we were rebels we did not deserve this but he in christ he adopted and made us children uh, forever Uh, later in in the passage john uses language like we've been born of god or his seed is in us something powerful has changed as adopted children because of the forgiveness that jesus won on the cross so god's true son by nature has won for us who by nature are not children and adoption as children forever it's it's a beautiful thing you know so john's writing in his last years he's done all his ministry he's done everything he's He's seen Jesus. He's written the book of Revelation. He's done a lot. At the end of his life, what makes his heart sing? That the Father loves him. You know, it's the best truth. The best truth. I hope, it, I hope you rejoice in it. I hope you meditate on it and let it fill your tank. And this then kind of rolls out into this sense of hopefulness. If God is your father, you have a hope for eternity that no one else has. So verse 2, um, so there's a sense of Jesus coming. Actually, chapter 2, verse 28, we want to be confident and unashamed at Jesus, at his coming. And then chapter 3, verse 2, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. We, we use this sometimes in church before confession. But we know that when he appears, I think when Jesus appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John's great desire 
is to be at home in heaven, seeing God, seeing Jesus, seeing the Father forever and ever. And, and you sense that yeah, nothing can replace that on earth until he gets that hope fulfilled. For most people, talking about the second coming of Jesus and the day of judgment gives them a sense of dread. But for us as, as Christian believers, we are children of God now. We are forgiven now. That day of judgment is a day of joy because we'll see Jesus and we'll be like him and, and be transformed forever. You know, and you think of John's own journey. He's already bragged in chapter 1 that he's seen Jesus incarnate. He's heard him and looked and touched. Um, but that's not the same as seeing Jesus at his final coming and being changed, being finally in your new resurrection body, transformed forever. John, John has also seen the visions of Revelation, but that's not enough. You know, that, that is just a foretaste of what's to come. John with us is awaiting that final transformative coming home at the second coming of Jesus. It's going to be great. It's going to be so great. So now we are children of God. God calls us his adopted children. He's lavished his love on you. And now we have this hope that we'll be like him when we see him. So just think, think, just let it sink in. Whatever you're struggling with, you know, God is your father. God loves you. God has poured his fatherly love. He's lavished it on you. Let that carry you. You know, every, most of the things about you will change. You know, the clothes you're wearing, you'll throw out one day. You know, relationships change and, um, you know, your, your work changes and your, your position or your, where you live. But being God's child is, is the, an unchanging truth now and forever. You are a child of God. He's lavished love on you. You can lose all things, but that will ever remain true. So meditate on it. Let it fill your tank. How do we live in the meantime? Well, in short, John says the adopted children should live in the resemblance of their adopted father, of their true father in heaven. And there's great encouragements in this section, to live a godly life, to live a pure life, to live an obedient life, to live a life that pleases the Father um, because he loves us so much and because we just, it's a delight to want to please the Father. And so there's, there's many phrases for this in John. He talks about abiding. Who do you abide in? So he talks in 228, dear children, continue in him, abide in Jesus so that when Jesus appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. goes on 29, if you know that he is righteous, then you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. And so it's also, it's good to try and um, bear the family likeness. So then it helps people see that you now belong to the Father and we can discern who else belongs to the Father by those that are trying to love him and honour him and please him and, and bear that likeness. Um, I, I do notice it with my own kids. I rarely get told that they look like me anymore, and I'm starting to wonder if it was just because when they're babies, um, they have big round heads, and Wayne Shuler has a big round head, and now they look more like their mum, and they're good looking, and, and you know. But the, you get the point, though, that you're meant to resemble the family you're in. And so the good news of 1 John 3 is this. It's not just by our own effort that we break out of the past, but God has broken a stronghold of sin in our lives. God has broken a dominion, actually of the devil and of the world in our lives. It's actually been broken as we believe the gospel. Listen to what he says, and it actually sounds like he's saying a Christian never sins. This, this, listen, it's... We have to clarify this. Verse 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin is kind of just you making up morality as you go and ignoring divine standards. 
But you know that Jesus, he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is in no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now, what's that saying? Is it saying a Christian never sins? Well, remember, friends, that 1 John famously, chapter 1, has that wonderful message about Christians should confess their sin to God and God is faithful and just and he will forgive them. So John clearly thinks Christians do sin. And so what does he mean? Well, I think what he's saying is, in our forgiveness, it's more than just a an abstract truth, but the power of sin is broken in us. We have a new freedom in Christ, in the Spirit, a freedom to try and obey that we never had before. It's like a new lease of life out of the dominion of sin. And so many translations translate this, you know, no one who practices sin, no one who you know, before, out of, out of Christ, we're stuck in a groove. You know, yes, an unbeliever can do good things, but the, the groove is ignoring God, you know, not caring what God thinks, doing things your own way, lawlessness. But now we're in a new groove, adopted as children, and sin doesn't have the dominion the way it did before. So the unbeliever abides in that kind of lawlessness and now we are called to abide in the Father and to abide in the Son, to continue in the Son. It's like saying the game has changed. The game has changed for us. I know we all struggle with sin, but we have a new lease of life, a new, a new desire at least, a new will that the seed of the Father is in us, that we want to please him even though it's hard and even though we, we fail. Let's listen to what Paul, uh, not Paul, John, says in terms of the devil's work. This is really, really powerful and, and freeing for us. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. Hint, he's hinting, by the way, that there will be Christian false teachers that will approve sin and just say, you don't have to change your life. That's not true. Don't, don't let them lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. So we want to bear that likeness. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So again, it's not talking about one-off sins. It's talking about a pattern of sinning from the beginning, a groove that the unbeliever is in, that we are not to go back into that groove. The reason, this is the, the great promise, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And what is the devil's work? To lawlessness, to, to, to get you to not care about pleasing God or resembling the Father. You know, and unbelievers don't care about that, but we care about that. And, and we want to live godly, pure lives to honor him. And so therefore, you know, talking about different states of domination, no one who is born of God will continue to sin in that, in that dominion. Because God's seed remains in him, he cannot go in sinning, on sinning because he's born of God. You cannot stay in that dominion, that, that defeatist plane. You must come and at least try to, to bear the family likeness. And then, of course, and then it becomes a tool to see where God is at work. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who, do, who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Well, we'll hear more about loving brother next week. That's really that John goes right into that. But, but really what, what, we're, what we're learning, friends, is that we're loved, adopted, forgiven, and the power is broken of the past life. And although you may habitually go back to it, because it's just because of that's your... That's all you know. God invites you to walk in obedience, to walk in purity, to walk trying to please him. And, and he empowers us to do it, even if it's slow, even if it fluctuates a bit, even if we fail often. The greatest privilege we have 
you know, failing often doesn't mean God is not our Father. Our status is unchanging. We have been lavished with love, divine fatherly love. The most radical thing we can do as Christians is to hold on to that with all our heart and to keep praying to God as Father. We take that for granted. You know, it's a radical thing to call God Father. You know, it's unique to Christianity to call God Father. For some other people, it's too bold, too blasphemous. But because God's Son died for us, we can't not, and he's called us his children We have to call him Father, and we have to relish in this truth. And if we're born of the Father, his seed is in us, the old power has been broken, the the back of it's been broken, even if bits of it remain. So continue in Jesus, abide in Jesus. You know, don't don't act like (coughs) obedience is too hard. You know, at least try, at least try and follow God's word. Jesus came to forgive sin. He came to take away sin and break it, break its power in our lives. Jesus is fully pure. And as we look forward to his coming, we want to live pure lives ready for him. Everyone who belongs to the Father is not of the world. What would it take for the world to see that we belong to the Father? It would take a church full of Radical obedience, radical holiness, radical gratitude to God as Father, radical love to God as Father, radical purity. May it be so at Berwick Anglican Church. Let's ask God to change us. Heavenly Father, with trembling we call on you as our Father because you have called us your children And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for lavishing love on us through your Son. Help us to live lives ready for your coming, holding on to our hope, and help us to take Christian living seriously. Help us to take obedience seriously so we bear your likeness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.